morning, good morning. Welcome all of you, thank you so much for coming. I'm really, really excited to be here. And I hope you are too. Um, before we start, I would just like to alert you that today's discussion will be, uh, we will be recorded uh, so that this event can be shared online and uh, can be archived for future research purposes. So during the Q&A, and I hope it's an active one, I expect it will be, I just ask you to look for that microphone which is going to be passed around. And don't be shy, you might hate microphones, I do. <laughs> so um, just you know, have fun with it, uh, use it as a prop, play Oprah, whatever works. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. Is Othello a racist play? Well, today's debate brings together a literary critic, a historian, and two superlatively accomplished theatrical professionals to tackle that, well, very pro provocative, um, even iconoclastic question. And of course, we will be doing so in reference to the current groundbreaking, very innovative, uh, some are calling it historical, uh, the current production on at the RSC. Um, as far as the structure of the next 90 minutes, we're going to begin, I'm going to begin by introducing myself and my fellow panel members, three gentlemen with whom I am honored to be sharing the spotlight. Uh, for an academic, it's really exciting to be on this stage, I have to admit, <laughs> even though it's the smaller one. So, uh, and I'll confess to a bit of stage fright as well, so, but that's okay, it's all good. So, um, after the introductions, I will invite each of our uh, panel members, each of the three gentlemen seated to my left, to respond to this very provocative question and give his uh, reflections on the play, uh, on the play in performance, of course, uh, on the historical aspect of uh, Shakespeare's play and his representations of uh, others, uh, cultural others. I hope we talk about gendered, gender and otherness as well. Um, and then, of course, the theatrical aspect. Um, so uh, that will take, um, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then each, after each of uh, my colleagues here speaks. Um, we will then open up into a more free-flowing just conversation amongst the four of us. And I, as I said in the green room, um, I have some pre-written questions for each of you. If you don't anticipate them in your initial um, brief uh, little um, uh, thumbprint comment, uh, I will try to raise them in our discussion. But also, I would like you to ask me questions and ask each other questions. So um, that's, that's what I have in mind here. Finally, of course, the culmination and climax of our 90 minutes will be your participation as an audience. And um, uh, let, me, let me begin by just uh, asking with a brief, uh, just a show of hands, how many of you have viewed this very exciting RSC Production, fabulous, oh, oh wow, okay. Ah, I gotta rein myself in now, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is good. This is really good news. So, um, good. Uh, Onyeka, you did not raise your hand. I'm raising my oh. hand. <laughs> I'm shy. Uh, Onyeka was my, was my seatmate in row D, uh, seat, uh, seat number 77. I hope to hear from people who are on the other side of the auditorium. I did not get to see much of Desdemona's face, facial acting, so please speak up. Um, okay, so uh, who am I? Uh, I am professor of English at Florida State University, specializing in Renaissance literature, feminist theory and criticism, and critical race studies. And I have dedicated a sizable chunk of my work, both in the classroom and in print, on the representation of racial difference and sexuality in Shakespeare's Othello and in his works overall. Now, Othello as itself, Othello specifically, this Shakespearean tragedy, uh, this is a play that haunts me. 
is a play I thought I was done with. Actually, in, it's, two, it's already 10 years. Back in 2005, when I published this book, Racism, Misogyny, and the Othello Myth, Interracial Couples from Shakespeare to Spike Lee, uh, I thought I was going to be done with it. I was not. I have sub subsequently talked about uh, uh, Virginia Woolf's a very interesting creative reworking of the play in her fanciful novel Orlando. And of course, here I am today. And having been at last night's production of Othello, I can promise uh, yet another publication or conference or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't stop. <laughs> um, so it haunts me. The play haunts me as a professional. But I also have to admit, it disturbs me as a person deeply. It disturbs me as an anti-racist. It also disturbs me as a feminist. Um, it disturbs me as an American. And I'm going to be very conscious of my accent today. So maybe there's some Americans in the audience, are there? One? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do hope you speak during the Q&A, ma'am. Um, OK. As an American, as an American, the play troubles me because I'm all too aware of the pernicious ideological misuses or uses and misuses of the play. Um, its popularity in the antebellum South uh, worries me. The Othello burlesques, their popularity worries me. However, something that I want us all to keep in mind is that the, the role was originally scripted to be performed by a white man wearing black makeup. So the question remains to be asked to what degree, to what degree were original performances, um, uh, were they prefiguring uh, that, that um, by now fortunately obsolete and crude literary genre known as the minstrel show? So this is a topic that, um, that we will all, uh, I hope, be, uh, be addressing. Um, so um, enough about me and my thoughts. I'd like to move on to introducing our, uh, my fellow panel members. Onyeka is, uh, and I, I, because I study the Renaissance, people might think I do this a lot, but this is a first for me, Onyeka. Uh, he is a Renaissance man a historian, a playwright, a novelist, a prize-winning novelist, a um, law lecturer, an activist, and a teacher. And most pertinently, pertinently to our discussion today, and I have another bit of show and tell here, he is an expert on the black population of Tudor England. Um, thanks to this exhaustive and groundbreaking study. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is it, I think the number is 250,000, the number of artifacts and documents you had to wade through in order to produce this, uh, this intellectual work. Okay, so this is quite a first, and it's going to make an important, uh, it's recently been recently published, 2013, 14, I believe. Uh, it's going to make a big difference. And it's also today going to allow um, us to understand a little bit better, perhaps, um, the real life counterparts to Shakespeare's tragic more. Uh, as well as possibly to get us to wrap our heads around the question of um, Shakespeare's culture, the degree to which we can call his culture racist, uh, whether that term applies. <coughs> so thank you for coming, Onyeka, and welcome. Beside Onyeka, we have, um, well, <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone that almost all of you are familiar with as uh, a surprisingly funny and complex Iago, Lucian Masamati. Uh, I've been working on that. <laughs> Masamati. <Pretty well done. laughs> okay. um, so uh, Lucian uh, brings to us a distinguished record of theatrical achievement. He is co-founder of Zimbabwe's acclaimed Over the Edge Theater Company, a group that performed, uh, has performed at the Ed Edinburgh Festival Fringe and other international venues. He is former artistic director of the Olivier Awarded Anglo-African Theater Company, Teata Fahanzi, another, 
Okay. <laughs> uh, the name the name means uh, theater of emancipation, correct? Theater yeah. of the emancipated, correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Lucien. His UK stage, stage credits include President of an Empty Room, Death and the King's Horseman, The Amen Corner, Pericles with the RSC. Speaking of Shakespeare, these were all, I believe, at the well at the National Theater or the RSC. Um, as far as TV and film credits, cre uh, credits we have, of course. Game of Thrones, my personal favorite. And the number one ladies detective agency, the International Richard II. I'm just hitting highlights here. Um, so thank you for thank coming, you. Lucian. We're excited to have you here. I am certainly Hugh Quarshi, a long-awaited Othello. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure many of you will say, worth the wait. Very well worth the the wait. Well, in addition to all of the impressive credentials on his resume, which uh, you might have already uh, looked at on our, on our website, Highlander, Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, mm. Hugh Quarshi <laughs> is, I have to add on a more personal note, I can't resist this, the only human being, real or imaginary, represented by an action figure that I personally own. <laughs> <laughs> I only own one. <laughs> um, I, I first met Hugh in, of all places, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where he was the inaugural lecturer. Uh, this was 1998 at the Hudson Strode, for the Hudson Strode Program in Renaissance Studies. And in that venue, very interesting venue, because uh, the University of Alabama was until then infamous, a US institution infamous for its role in, uh, for its legacy in US uh, interracial relations, having been the site of a stand against desegregation in the 60s. However, the university was working to uh, correct that legacy. This event starring, starring Hugh, not in a uh, theatrical role, but an academic role, uh, an academic role that was praised universally by our graduate students as well as our undergraduates and the provost of the university as well. It was a smashingly successful lecture. The lecture's title was Second Thoughts About Othello, uh, something that I'm hoping that Hugh will be, yes, I'm gonna make you talk about <laughs> it <laughs> because this, this distinguished actor has had his uh, hesitations about the role and um, Maybe this is a, a good segue into asking you to speak sure. to today's yeah. topic, Hugh. 